uh, that we can learn about from Genesis 1. And then part 2, that will be next week, we're talk, going to see vocation, career, and a job. And uh, third week, we are going to look at Christian principles of work theology, uh, how, to, how to work well. And then uh, fourthly, fourth week, we are going to look at leadership principles of the workplace, how to exercise Christian leadership at the workplace. So we have these four sessions. And I want us to reflect on these questions for two minutes. And I would really appreciate it if some of you can give some feedback. Uh, you may be shocked to know that we have a God who is working. You know, we have a God who is working, unlike the popular understanding that God is in heaven just relaxing. Uh, <clears throat> And I want you to think of some implications. What does it mean for us in practice if we have a God who is working? <clears throat> How does it change anything for us? So that is the first question for us to reflect about. And then uh, Adam and Eve were asked to do different kinds of work in Genesis 1 and 2. Would you remember some kinds of things that God wanted them to do? What are the different kinds of work that he assigned them to do? And then uh, Adam and Eve were created on the sixth day. And then on the seventh day, they were asked to rest. You know, why? of energy and they would be put to work but actually they were put to rest now what does that mean for us in practice finally i want us to list some of the results of the fall how the workplace has become such a mess what are the practical challenges you see in the workplace which i think is all because of the fall described in Genesis chapter 1. And so, can I have some reactions from some of you about any of these four questions? People can speak out or put the comments in the chat box. Yeah, uh, that is the other thing. You can just put it in the chat box. Uh, how, how will I see the chat box? We will read it out here. Ah, yes, it's on the top, right? If anyone has put some stuff on the chat box. Can you please read it out? Yes, uh, uh, we will read it out if it comes on the chat box. Okay. No comments thus far. Okay. So God is working, so we need to work. That's the only implication, I believe. Yes. Okay. Uh, God is working, so we have to work. So what does that actually mean if you dissect that out further can you dissect that out a bit further does that mean work is good or bad you were chosen to do good work uh, because God is working, work itself is a good thing. Is that right? 
Yes, yes. What is the opposite of that? What do people often think about work? Idling. Idling. Idle. Opposite of work. Yes, no, I, I understand that. But what do people, what con conception people have of work? It is a, like, it is not a good thing. That means it's a curse. Don't people think of it as a curse? Some people. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm saying that because God is a working God, uh, work must be good because God himself, who is good, is working. So work is a good thing, it's a blessed thing. And it's a great privilege to be able to partner with God because, you know, you become partners with God in work. So work is a very privileged activity. It is not a curse. And what else does it mean? Work was there before the fall. And so in heaven, there may be work in heaven. Right? Because uh, we often think that work will be finished by the time, you know, you you end this life or after you retire, but actually there will be work in heaven and the work in heaven will be extremely enjoyable. You'll be discovering the beauty and the glory of God in everything you see and learn. So, so that understanding of work is important. So that is the implication of a working God. But I think I will continue with my uh, with my presentation, all these other things will... There was one work. more response, sir. If yeah. God is at work, we need not work as though everything depends on us. Uh, that's, uh, that's exactly right, because we are partners with God. So we have a... Uh, somebody needs to mute their mic. Somebody needs to mute their mic. Because we have a senior partner who is working, we need not feel as if everything depends on us because we have a senior partner who is able to help and resolve complicated matters and things that we don't understand. Very good. That was a very good uh, input and I will add it and put it in my presentation. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Yeah, if uh, God is working, there is some work which God is doing and there are some work which God is not doing. So how yeah. do we differentiate? Okay, uh, we will look at that. <clears throat> Thanks. But, uh, but uh, you'll be surprised by how much God depends on us for his kingdom work. He will, of course, bring it to completion, but he expects us to do our bit. He expects us to give our energy wholeheartedly to be able to do the kingdom work and what we cannot finish and what is the loose ends that are very complicated for us to tie, the future and the past, we cannot tie together all those things. Those things God will complete and God will make it beautiful. You know, our work will be rough, but God will polish it and make it beautiful and glorious. And God will also give us credit. Your name might be written on some of the things that you have done on a very small scale, but which God completes, and then he will give you the credit for that. So we have a wonderful God who is able to complete, beautify, glorify the work, and actually give us credit for, for the work that gets going to be done. Okay, so that was a good question. <clears throat> Shall I continue with the next slide? Yeah. Okay, now we have a God, I told you, who is a God who works not only in the past, but at the present. And I will show you what he's doing presently. But this is what he did in the past. He created the light, the firmament, the land, the, the more specific lights. You know, the, the light he created on the first day was just energy. And on the fourth day, 
he condensed the light into the sun, moon, and stars. So more specific lights he created. And on the fifth day, he created the fish and the fowl. Sixth day, he created land animals and importantly, man. And then on the seventh day, he rested. So God worked in the past and he continues to work to this day. Uh, it says that in John 5, 17, to this very day, my father is at work and I too am working. So Jesus is also working. What work does he do? It says in Hebrews, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Uh, <clears throat> that means he has put laws in place, but still that requires upholding. And we don't fully understand what that upholding means unless we know all of physics and chemistry and mathematics and astronomy. Uh, we are not going to fully understand what this means, but we know that God is continually working, upholding the universe by the word of his power. And then, more specifically in Psalm 121, he says, He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he, behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber or sleep. The Lord is your keeper. That means... In a, for us, applying it to us personally, he is very alive to what is happening to each one of us. And he's mindful of every little thing that happens to us. And that also requires a lot of work because there are billions and billions of people. So, uh, you know, God continues to work to this day. And since God is a working God, work is holy. You know, it is not a curse. It's good. Uh, and so we need to work with a good motivation and a positive motivation. And there will be work in heaven. And, uh, <clears throat> and guess what? We will be enjoying it. You know, very often people will say, oh my God, not again, work here. But you know, work in heaven will be without the consequences of the fall and we will thoroughly enjoy the work that we are going to do in heaven. Now, uh, I, I asked you the question, what kinds of work did God ask man to do? Uh, he asked him to do manual work. Do you remember the reference? Any of you? To tend, uh, to tend and keep the garden. Yes. So that was manual work. He, there was a garden of Eden. Man was asked to tend and keep it. Tend means it is to nurture it. He has to probably put fertilizer or water or something. Probably, I, I'm not sure exactly what, but then he had to work at it. And that was manual work. And then he was given governance work. And do you know what governance work he was given? Subdue the earth. Yes. And rule, rule over all kinds of okay. life. Now, very good. Now, uh, how do you understand those words, subdue and rule? Keep it in order and uh, make sure things go well. Very good. What it does not mean is exploit it. You know, we were not supposed to exploit the creation. We were supposed to, uh, we are supposed to uh, do things that will nourish it and make it thrive and flourish. Uh, so that was the governance work we were given. And creation means not only the living, creatures, but the whole creation, the cosmos, the earth and the soil and the water and the air and all that is in it. So that was the governance work to do. So that was leadership. Man was the CEO of creation. Now, isn't that a great identity to have? 
we are the CEOs of creation. We are not just some animals. Uh, we have a, a, a leadership role in the, in the creation. So that was governance work. And what scientific work did God give us? Multiply. To name. Pardon? To name the animals. Yes. Naming the animals. Now, why is it a scientific work? Taxonomy. Yes. Very good. That's for botany. <laughs> but even that involves knowing the characteristics and the features of the plant, correct? Yes. You have to know whether it is, uh, you know, I don't know what are the different kinds of, uh, whether it's an algae or fungi or whether it's a, a different kinds of things. So uh, similarly naming the animals, mammals and uh, arthropods and uh, reptiles and all that, you have to know what they're doing, know their structure and function and then name them. So that is the beginning of scientific work. And then the work of relationships. How did God give us that work? Somebody mentioned something previously? Mul multiply and fill the earth. Yes. Now, is that a lot about only sexual activity? You know, just multiply. Like animals multiply. But the multiplication will involve getting along well. Right. And if you don't get along well, what happens? You have fights and you will kill each other. You know, one man will be jealous and then he will kill and men will do things that others don't like and he'll get killed, women will get killed and then they will, they will not flourish. So, and children will not grow up because children need a lot of love and affection and they will not get that if it's only about uh, sexual activity. So it is about the work of really? relationships, you know, uh, relationship between husband and wife, relationship in the family, and between families and community. So, uh, so you can see how even just in the Garden of Eden, uh, such a lot of diversity there was in the more kind of work uh, man was supposed to do. Okay, now this is what uh, manual work. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it and then rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Genesis 1, 28, governance function, scientific function, out of the ground, the Lord formed every beast of the field, every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that's, that was its name. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. Uh, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So you can see that very wide variety of activities are involved. In other words, <clears throat> all this work is holy. It is holy because it was there before the fall. <clears throat> You know, the Garden of Eden is actually a picture of heaven. Uh, in the Garden of Eden, there was no sin before the fall came. So all this work that Adam was doing was holy work. There was no sacred or secular division. Labor work, governance work, scientific work, and the world of work of building families is all holy. Just a word about building families, you know, very often uh, <clears throat> women, women, women will introduce themselves and say, 
I'm only a homemaker. I'm only a housewife. Now, uh, that is not the Christian understanding because the Christian understanding is that uh, the work of work in the house is uh, all about building relationships. And it is probably the most important part of all the four kinds of work. Okay, now, uh, there was uh, this man called John Calvin, <clears throat> and we will talk more about the sacred secular division a little later on, how we think that some work is holy and some work is not holy. What is the kind of work we think is holy and good? Anyone? The work of a priest. Yes, very good. The EMFI staff. <laughs> and uh, mission hospital work. Evangelists. And some people might include if they are pushed, doctors and nurses and teachers. But more than this, most people will not allow. They will say this work is sacred, very holy. What about business work? Could they think it's holy? No. And what about other things? You know, just, just doing uh, computer science, is that holy work? No, they will not think of that as holy work. But that is not the biblical understanding. <clears throat> uh, now, John Calvin, he realized the importance of every man doing work as if it is holy, as if it is a vocation, as if it is a calling. And we will look at that a little later. Now, uh, something happened. During the work that had to be done, there was a boundary. They were not supposed to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. By eating of the forbidden fruit, they became arbiters of good and evil. That means they became the definition of good and evil. You know, our definition of good and evil is what God says. And what we know about God says is in the Bible. So we use God and the Bible as the arbitrary, ar arbitration council, you know, for good and evil. But Adam and Eve ate the fruit and they wanted to define good and evil by themselves. And so there was a fall and I want you to just see what happens in the fall. Work began to be seen as a punishment And so what happened? The meaning disappeared. Work became meaningless. Uh, man lost the joy of work. Work became stressful. Work outcomes were corrupted. Initially, the work outcome was to please God and to uh, build the kingdom of God. Now the work outcome lost its eternal perspective and instead money, power and control became the goal of work. And then the workplace is devoid of values. Before the way you work, the, even the process and the method was important. It had to be done in a way that was pleasing to God. Now there was an envy and a spirit of competitiveness in the workplace. There was discrimination, you know, uh, promoting your relatives and your friends, your cronies. Sexual harassment ha began to happen in the workplace. Exploitation entered the workplace. You get them to work very hard and you pay them very little. So. The work was utterly corrupted, the work scenario. 
Would you identify with this? Would you like to add something more? Do you know the story of Sisyphus? Uh, Sisyphus was a Greek mythological character. He was uh, like a little Greek god. You know, there are many gods. He was a, a little Greek god and he was very naughty. So some senior gods decided to punish him. And the best punishment they thought they could give him is to get him to push a rock up the hill in the morning and it will reach its destination up on the hill by sundown. And then when he gets up in the morning, the rock will be down again at the bottom and then he has to go again and push it up. Every day you push it up, it rolls down and then again he pushes it up. So that was a punishment. And work actually for us has become a meaningless toy, just like Sisyphus. No motivation. And then uh, they realized that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made, made coverings for themselves. That means they knew they were naked, but they did not know that they were internally naked too. You know, what do, what do I mean by internal nakedness? Hey folks, some response. They didn't know uh, the impact of their disobedience. Yes. And uh, uh, yes. the brokenness that happened because of that. Yes. And the evil that began entered their, that person, you know, uh, Anger, jealousy, murder, lust, covetousness, rebellion. They were full of these things, but they did not know it. In other words, they felt shame, but they did not feel guilt. Did you understand that? Mm. Now, why do I say that they felt shame, but they did not feel guilt. Hey folks, some of you can think and give me some reply. It will encourage me. Shame itself is not a guilt. Yes. Shame itself is not a guilt. They saw uh, only themselves, sir, instead of saying to God. <coughs> Well, if they had felt guilt, what would they have done? The way they reacted gives us a clear understanding that they felt shame, but they did not feel guilt. They went and hit themselves. Yes, so they felt shame. But they did not feel guilt. How do you know that? Otherwise, they would have repented then and there. They right. would have come to God and then. Exactly right. They did not come to God and repent and saying, Lord, I have sinned. Forgive me. Instead, what did they do? They put the blame on somebody else. Adam put the blame on Eve and Eve put the blame on the servant. They did not take responsibility of the guilt. If you really feel guilty, you will take the responsibility. You will not blame the circumstances. Is that correct? That is true repentance. When you truly repent, you will say, I have made a mistake, Lord. I'm sorry. You will not say, uh, there was too much pressure on me, so I did it. Then, then you're not really admitting your guilt. So they felt shame, but they did not feel guilt. So you can see they were already, their personhood was already divided. You know, they were, Schizophrenic. They felt shame, but they did not feel guilt. 
and because uh, they began to understand some truths and they did not understand other truths. That means they were, they understood superficial intuitive truths, but they did not understand more profound truths. So they became, you know, schizophrenic. And because of that, all sorts of dichotomies entered their minds. I'm just giving you three, but they can be hundreds and dozens of them. One dichotomy that entered their mind was body versus the soul. They began to think of the body as dirty because they hid themselves. You know, they thought the body was dirty. It was the body that was causing them to sin and they hid themselves. But they thought, you know, that soul was clean. They thought the earth was bad, but they thought the heavens were good. And similarly, they thought of work was dichotomized into sacred and secular. Uh, <clears throat> I've already told you this. Okay, so these are the three kinds of dichotomies that happened. The secular work and the sacred work. We won't look at the body and soul dichotomy or the earth and heaven dichotomy. Maybe another time. But there was the secular work and sacred work dichotomy that we mentioned earlier. Now, the three dichotomies are connected. Can you try and connect the three dichotomies? Is it that secular work is done only on the earth using the body, sir? Very good. Very good. The secular work is done on the earth using the body. And the sacred work is done by the soul so that you can go to heaven. So this is how they got dichotomized into three parts. <clears throat> that was brilliant. Who was that? I am Konik, sir, from Velo. Konik. Very good. Okay, so the three dichotomies are here. Work church, mission, and non-profit work is sacred. Government and private and for-profit work is uh, either profane or it has less value. In the, if you divide, person got divided into body and soul. The soul is good, the body is bad. Either bad or sort of uh, uh, secular. Not uh, not sacred. <clears throat> Do you know some cultures where they think the body is bad? Well, uh, I come from a Jain background and we believe that the body and Buddhists also, they think of the body as a prison for the soul and it's supposed to be very dirty and they often torture the body so that the soul is released. So, you know, that's just uh, digressing from the point. And then the cosmos, heaven was sacred and the earth was less sacred. Uh, how are they connected? The secular work helps us to flourish on earth. Body goes back to the earth. Soul goes to heaven and sacred work helps us to go to heaven. So this is how the three dichotomies are connected. Uh, <clears throat> now, people already had this sort of dichotomies in their minds because we had become schizophrenic. You know, we couldn't put things together. We could not think of truth in an integrated way. So all the truths were sort of broken into many parts. But unfortunately, this man formalized it into religion. You know, you would expect someone who is a biblical scholar to uh, give us a, a biblical opinion. But unfortunately, though Eusebius was a, a, a great saint, he was a very good man, by the way, and he was the bishop of uh, Palestine in Jerusalem. 
and he said there are two ways of life there is the perfect life or the life of contemplation higher sacred life separated life that means a holy life people who don't come into touch with the world people who are living in cloisters have you heard of cloisters cloister yes. nuns yes. you know monks pardon cloistered monks. monks and cloistered nuns they used to live in cloisters cloisters are like uh, like monasteries in a desert you know far away from civilization uh and then there were silent monks and silent nuns who will not speak at all for years together so that is a separated life and they lived spiritually superior lives priest priests nuns monks and aristocrats i think uh, ucb has in included aristocrats so that they can give donation to the church but maybe i'm being too cynical uh, and then there was the permitted life the lower and the secular life a, a life that was diluted by the world diluted by marriage spiritually inferior homemakers farmers laborers were sort of people who lived the permitted life so this division was formalized in the church now this dichotomy had many consequences uh you know when truth get distorted it will not remain in the mind it will begin to have consequences in the way we behave and then it will have consequences on the society itself you know you might think it's only an idea but ideas have consequences sometimes very severe consequences and so this dichotomy produced severe consequences and i want you to think about those consequences and please share them remember <clears throat> you don't learn by hearing you don't learn by reading you learn by reflection so i'm asking you this question so that you reflect and only when you reflect will you learn if you don't reflect it will be just a fact you will just put you will file fact in part of your brain and it will not it will it will not be dynamic so i want you to reflect on this question what are the consequences in our everyday life because of this secular sacred work dichotomy we tend to give uh, our best energies to either the secular or the spiritual work not to both sir okay uh, but i think you have put it somewhat mildly uh, we give 100% of our energy to uh either secular work or sacred work but i think sometimes it can be a little worse than this we give our full energy to sacred work and not give enough energy to secular work and i will tell you why i am right secular work is done from monday to friday or saturday and uh, sec and sacred work is done on sunday sundays, sundays. okay so uh, <clears throat> all the work that gets done in society if you divide it into uh, domains what are the kinds of work that gets done on a sunday 
and what are the kinds of work that get done from Monday to Saturday. When do we do politics? Monday to Saturday, right? Nobody's agreeing. Uh, when do we do education? Monday and when, to Saturday. And when do we do uh, uh, media and entertainment? All days. And when do we do, uh, you know, other kinds of work like uh, scientific work? Okay, the point of saying all that is, is this that Christian people have not exercised influence in society for the domains that get done from Monday to Saturday. They have had influence only on work that gets done on Sundays because Christian people have had this dichotomy and so they give their 100% when it comes to mission and you know to seemingly sacred things but to seemingly secular things, they have not given their whole heart. So we have not been able to establish dominion over the creation. You know, that is the command in Genesis. Is work and work happens from Monday to Saturday. If all work is holy, Okay, now this is a quotation from Abraham Kuyper. He says, uh, uh, he was the prime minister of Netherlands. He was also a great theologian. In those days, many politicians were great theologians. Many scientists were also great theologians. The reason was they had broad education. Anyway, so Abraham Kuyper says this, our king's dominion must include all of creation. And for that reason, all orders and kingdoms in creation must be saved from the oppression under which they now groan. There is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry mine. That means, God wants to have dominion over every aspect of his creation. He wants kingdom to be established in every domain. Okay, uh, these were the seven domains. I am adding one more domain, and that is the health domain. Uh, arts and entertainment domain, business domain, education domain, family domain, government, and politics, media, uh, and religion, So this and health. So these are the eight mountains of culture, eight domains. In India, how many domains, in how many domains do Christians have influence? Hey, some, some comments and some remarks. Education, sir. Pardon? Education, some are really good. Yes, that's good. We have some influence over the education and that is because? Missionaries. missionaries yes, there were so many uh, mission schools and colleges for men and women. But I think especially the women's education made a big impact. But is this influence going down? Are we losing ground? Yes, sir. Uh, we have not uh, uh, gained any influence in higher Already education. Sir. 
Right. We have we have very little influence in higher education, though there are some institutions, maybe some of the best known institutions of higher education are still Christian, but not technically, you know, not engineering, but yes, in medicine and in arts and science, there are colleges which are like number one and number two, St. Xavier's and Loyola College and uh, Sacred Hearts and St. Stephen's and all that. So we have some influence in the education sector, but we are losing that, we are losing ground. Okay, then which are the other areas where we have influence? Healthcare. So. Healthcare, yes. In the health, and that is again because missionaries started that off, but we have lost ground. Uh, because we did not enter the urban areas because we felt we, we had some reservations about, about having help for all and being involved in research and being involved in planning, entering the health policy in the government. And so we lack behind. But I agree, we have still some influence and we can still grow and make an impact. What about other areas? Religion, religion. Yeah, the religious mountain. Uh, we have we have some influence. Again, this is a mountain where we are being replaced, but certainly uh, we have an edge in the rural areas. I'm sure. Okay, and then arts and entertainment. And the scale of zero to ten, maybe one, one, maybe yeah, Bollywood and Hollywood and Tollywood and everybody else there, but we don't have any kind of entertainment at all. And is entertainment important? It's very important because it's a powerful tool for communication. <clears throat> You know, Christian music, for example, uh, Christian drama, Christian movies, these things have not come up in a, in a big way. And then business. Zero to 10, where would you put Christian business? Zero. Close to zero, yes. And is it important? Yes, because business people are people who give, uh, who write the ethics, the work ethics. You know, this is the way to do it. This is the no copying. You cannot, no plagiarizing, you know, copyright and all those things. They have values coming in time. And so if there are no Christian business people, the work ethics will be written by others. And so we will lose out. So, and uh, family, what about family? Marriage, sex, counseling, bringing up children. I think we have some influence especially because of the schools, we influence children and children influence the family in some way. But I think again, this is an area where we have not made much progress. And what about government and politics? Zero, zero. Zero, yes. Uh, it is so important to be in the government because you are influencing the policy of the whole nation. You know, one person can make an impact for the whole country. Uh, okay, media, arts and ent entertainment and media, they are separated, but in India, both of them are like zero to one.
And do you agree that this is all because of the sacred secular division? If I say, for example, that God is calling me to be the chief minister or health minister, would you, would you think of it as a good idea or will you say, no, Dr. Shah, you should be a missionary? Good ideas. <laughs> I hope uh, you can all say that after this lecture. Okay, now, uh, what does it mean in practice? Now you see uh, the Northeast India. I know there is someone from Tripura here, uh, but I, I hope she'll agree with me. Northeast India is about 95% Christian. Maybe there is, a, there is one state, Manipura, which is probably uh, only 50% Christian. But all the other Northeast states are quite Christian. And yet the corruption rates in the Northeast is about the same as the corruption rate in Hindu India. So what, what does it tell you about work ethics? Secular and sacred. You know, on Sunday, you, don't want, you may not take a bribe, but from Monday to Saturday, <clears throat> you might take a bribe. Even Christians may. That's what he tells us. Is that a fair understanding? Okay. Uh, this is Africa. Christian Africa is in red. Sub-Saharan Africa. <clears throat> uh, north of the Sahara is Arabic. <clears throat> uh, Corruption levels, Christian Africa is just a little bit more than Arabic Africa. HIV rates much higher in Christian Africa and less in Arabic Africa. So why do we want people to be Christians? If it doesn't affect corruption levels, if it has no impact on behavior, then why, why are we, you know, talking about the kingdom of God? Because we have had a faulty understanding. We have had this secular sacred division. If all of us, including the, the small businessman, to the taxi driver, to the, to the politician, to the collector, uh, to the teacher, to the nurse and the doctor, if all of them did what was good and right in God's sight, then the whole culture will be transformed. It will affect every aspect of the country. There will be not only really no corruption, there will be all other kinds of things, murders, uh, rapes, and everything will go down. So this is why I feel one of the most important messages for today is that we should get rid of this sacred and secular division. We should tell people, whatever you do, put God in the center. Do it with a sense of vocation. Do it so that it becomes a part of the kingdom. Okay, so far so good. Uh, what have you understood? Any comments? Any of you disagree with something that I've said? I've learned that all work is holy, sir. Okay. Thank you. Any others? Sir, uh, I, I don't disagree, but uh, uh, I, I think that the concept of the holy yeah. is uh, necessary in a fallen world. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, because uh, from the fall, I think uh, there has been instituted um, because of the fall, yeah. uh, a call to uh, holiness. 
yeah. uh, which is uh, which is described by let us say israel getting a set of rules yeah uh, which is not complete but still to stand against a world which is dominated by so, so the the call of a holy people you are a holy nation and so yeah. inside the holy nation there are symbols which once again remind even the holy nation about a concept of holy uh, which is again imperfect because that temple was cast out by the lord it is said yeah. to be destroyed so mm-hmm. i think doing away totally with the uh, uh, secular versus holy uh, might leave us without symbols so i think there may be uh, a nation or a people or uh, an office which reminds the world and even the children of god uh, keeps reminding them about a concept of holy even if that holiness itself is not a uh, definitely a perfect holiness sir okay <clears throat> now the holiness can't be in a in the kind of work you do holiness needs to be the way and the motivation with which you do it because you can be uh like a holy king and you can be an unholy king so kingship which is politics uh can be holy they were holy rulers i mean david was a uh holy you know king and uh joseph was a holy minister who who worked according to and also daniel he also was holy in the way he provided leadership but his work again was uh, very political there was uh, there was uh, gideon who was a soldier military but he did his work in a way that pleased god uh david was also a warrior but he did his battle in a way that pleased god so i think it is more about attitudes and the inside and the motivation rather than the kind of work you do but maybe we can have continue this debate after this maybe i uh, i don't even think it's a debate sir. it's just a yeah just a uh, just a small point to so that it can go along with us in this four weeks to deepen yeah, yeah sure yes yeah uh, sorry what was your name so we can talk later <laughs> because i may i may be wrong too so i just want to <laughs> uh, sir, sam sam said that sir oh okay sam okay it's difficult to recognize the voice on this uh, thing sorry <clears throat> okay now a man was created on the 6th day sir, and then can i ask one question please ah uh, yes please uh, uh solomon uh, he is supposed to be the wisest person yes uh, but his uh, take on work was yes he was saying work is work all work under the heaven is futile yes so was it because of this uh, particular dichotomy that he no 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 he was he was describing not prescribing you know he was describing the situation under the sun he was not prescribing the work under the uh, the work. he was not saying like it says in proverbs a little if you give him a tip he makes a person happy you know it's somewhere it says now that again is a description it is not a prescription it describes uh, how people and i am i'm going to talk about this it describes how people uh um are working more because of jealousy and to get brownie points over another person uh and to be better than other person so he is describing the situation the fallen situation but he is not saying 
we should be doing this. Is that a reasonable answer? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Now, man was created on the sixth day. And then uh, on the seventh day, he started off by not soon after the seventh day. On the seventh day, his life started off by resting. Now, my question is this. Did he deserve to rest even before doing any work? You know, he, the guy was just created. He was just full of beans, <clears throat> uh, full of energy. Then you are asking him to just take rest. So what is this rest God is talking about? Some comments? Um, preparation for work, sir. A preparation for work. But uh, how can you prepare for work by, you know, sleeping or resting? Why did, he, why did God want, he was just created on the sixth day. Maybe the rest we are understanding in a, maybe we are, we are understanding the rest in a different way. Yeah, very good. We are understanding the rest in a different way. Uh, and so what, what would be the likely meaning of that word rest? Maybe resting in, in him, what to do, what not to do, and getting counseling from him. Uh, okay. But God also rested. So God was not going to be, I don't think God was, uh, he was not going to, do you think he was counseling uh, Adam and Eve about how to work? Maybe, I mean, we don't know enough. So, okay, maybe that's one explanation. Any other? Remember, God also was resting. Uh, now, this is a very important question because it gives us an idea of what the Sabbath should be. And there was night and day the first day. You know, the day starts with night. It doesn't start with the day. So rest comes before work. And we work because we know rest. That means work is prepaid, not postpaid. That means we have the motivation to work comes before we are charged up. Prepaid means we are charged up before we start working, highly motivated, and then we work. We are not working exhausted and then sleep during the weekend. Now that is postpaid. Now that is not how it is, how it is. Biblically, work starts with rest. Now the question is: what is the rest? What does it mean? Uh, rest was more about celebrating God and his love than simply working off exhaustion. <clears throat> that means uh, it was about relationship. Uh, you said, someone said it was about counseling, how to do work. Uh, it was not about counseling about how to do work. It was counseling about how God loves Adam and Eve and how they love God and they were celebrating each other's love and enjoying that work, enjoying that relationship. So rest is about celebration and rest is about um, relationship. I'm sure that, you know, for human beings, uh, it is also about physical rest. So it is not only, it is called rest because celebration produces rest, especially celebration with someone you love gives us great motivation and helps us rest and physical rest. So both of them are involved in 
the concept of resting. So God was, man was created on the sixth day and then there was celebration. And he was highly motivated because of this fact that he was so loved by God. And so he was able to work with his wholehearted energy. <clears throat> People agree with that? Yes, sir. So work is not for rest, but from rest, sir? Yes. Work flows from rest. That means because you are full of positive energy that comes from the love of God and from the relationship with God, you are keen to do work. So that work flows out of that rest and motivation. So this is why before man started working, he rested and then he worked. Night and day, that was the first day. Uh, this is a quote from, uh, this is a Jewish lady he wrote an, she wrote an article in the New York Times. I saw it in the in internet, of course. I don't read the New York Times. Um, she said, stilling the eternal inner murmur of self-reproach. And she said, she was giving advice to the New Yorkers that they should stop working on Sundays. They should stop uh, restaurants and shopping and malls and all kinds of work and we should bring back the Sabbath. And the reason is, he said all the New Yorkers are suffering from an inner murmur of self-reproach. Now what is that inner murmur? Uh, the inner murmur says, Achieve, you're not good enough. See the others, you're no good. You have to work harder, you have to work harder, you have to work harder. You keep hearing that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then you go on and on and on and on. The, and the mama is never quiet. The mama keeps on saying, you're not good enough, you have to work harder, you have to work harder. And so she says, you should, uh, you may take a vacation, but unfortunately, even when you take a vacation, the inner mama says, keep saying, see those friends who are on vacation? They, are, they have got a better suite, they have got a better car, they have got a better behaved family. You're useless, you're useless, and you know, you work harder, you work harder. So, the Inner mama is never quiet. Even if you go on a vacation, it doesn't help you. And then when you go into God's presence on the Sabbath, you find unconditional acceptance. Yes, I have failed in the week, but God says, okay, we, this is not the time to worry about failures. I want to just enjoy you. I accept you as you are with all your failures. God celebrates whatever you have achieved and he promises you to help you to complete what you have not achieved. Enough for today, let's celebrate for now. You know, so you hear that on the Sabbath, uh, this relationship, and then you celebrate. And this then gives you the energy to work during the week. So that is what I call Work flows from rest. Rest is not a necessity because of the work. Uh, and she continues saying, we could let the world wind us up and set us to marching like mechanical dolls that go and go until they fall over because they don't have a mechanism that allows them to pause. But that would make us less than human. We have to remember to stop because we have to stop to remember. So this is an advice from a Jewish lady who was not 
probably she was not a Christian. And then again, it says here, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. And now I want you to appreciate something here. You know, the rest is while you are yoked. That means the yoke, you the yoke is there when the, the bulls are working, right? So you find rest in the work. So I'm proposing that the rest and prayer should not only be sequential, but should be synchronous. That means rest and work, rest and work, rest and work. That is sequential. It should be that way, all one. You know, Sabbath and then Monday to Saturday. Sabbath, uh, rest and work, sequential. But it can be synchronous also. That means while you're working, you have to find rest. <clears throat> Uh, is it possible? And we will look at this in uh, later on in the in the third uh, in the third session that I do. How uh, work and rest can be synchronous? How they can happen at the same time? Just like Paul said, pray without ceasing. You can actually find rest while you're working synchronously also. Yeah, there was a question on that, sir. How is it possible to that work and rest can be synchronous? Uh, it says here in Matthew eleven twenty nine, you shall find rest unto your souls. Take my yoke. I mean, I I think it is about a mode. You know, mode means uh, you are in that uh, in that sort of frame of mind where. You're saying, uh, Lord, I'm doing all this uh, because you love me and I want to glorify your name. And you have that attitude inside and in that framework you're working. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, one of my favorite patron saints of this synchronous uh, work, rest, uh, you know, theology, a chap called Brother Lawrence. And maybe shall we leave it at that point when I come to that? Is that okay? We'll talk about that when I talk about Brother Lawrence. Okay, sir. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, work was ordained by God and not a curse. All work is holy. God is still working and as children we should too. Work needs to start off by restful celebration with God. So these are some conclusions. Uh, but then since you asked that question, <clears throat> uh, let me just talk about Brother Lawrence. I may talk about it again later on. Brother Lawrence was a Carmelite monk. His original name was Nicholas. And he joined the monastery. Uh, he wanted to be actually a seminarian, but they told him he was not bright. He was not very, he was not intelligent enough to study. <clears throat> so uh, he said, he said he's happy to do whatever is necessary. And so he was asked to peel potatoes and to mend shoes of the seminarians. So this is what he did. So he was, help, he was helping in the kitchen and he was also repairing sandals. And uh, he wrote a book called Practicing the Presence of God. So that's why we know a lot about him. And he says, when I'm peeling potatoes, I used to say, God is telling me, Brother Lawrence, you've done such a good job of peeling a potato. 
you have peeled it to perfection. <clears throat> and I'm so happy. So he used to imagine God speaking to him. And this is what he calls practicing the presence of God. And he said by practice, as soon as I entered the kitchen, I would say, good morning, God, and God would speak to him. And he felt the reality of God in the kitchen. So much so, he says, I felt the reality of God more in the kitchen than in the chapel where he used to have his evening worship with the others. So uh, you can imagine how that is possible, you know, the work and um, rest principle can happen at the same time. Have I sort of answered your question? I mean, there is no answer to this question. It's a mystery to me. I haven't actually found that true in my own life. So I cannot talk with any great degree of confidence, but I'm just telling you what I've been reading and what maybe I have learned a little bit, uh, but I think uh, all of you will learn much faster Any more comments or questions? For certain uh, works, we can find that is okay. Yes. But uh, many of the works, we don't find that uh, resting. That may be like practicing that presence of God. Uh, many of the? Many works, many other works. Like you know, certain, we what we like it in that we may find yeah. God. But some other places, many, many works, now we don't uh, synchronize that. Okay. Now, this is what Brother Lawrence said. Uh, peeling potatoes is mundane work. But, says, but he says, when you do it for the Lord, it does not remain mundane anymore. It becomes holy. The work of peeling potatoes becomes holy when you do it with a sense of vocation and when you do it for God. So I believe that any work becomes boring. When I was a young surgeon, you know, I just finished MS. I used to think I will never be bored if I do surgery. If I do hernias, even if I did a thousand hernias, I'll never be bored because it is so interesting. But actually, in just several years, I used to say, oh my, not a hernia again. It's so boring. Not an abscess, you know, not just suturing. I'd like to do some fancy operations. So I believe that any work becomes mundane. And the only way you can keep a work interesting is you, if you have a sense of vocation and if you're doing it for the kingdom, only then will it not only become interesting, but it will become holy and very enjoyable. So I think every, every kind of work has the possibility that it will become boring. You might think that yeah, just opening the gate and closing the gate for a watchman is so boring. But you know, even if you're doing heart surgery, if you're doing it day in and day out every day, after five years, it'll become boring. So uh, the only way it, we can prevent boredom from coming into work is if it is not a job and that it becomes a vocation. Other questions or reflections? Sir, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for clarifying that the Sabbath is not a dichotomy between secular and sacred work, but a uh, principle of rest. But uh, practically speaking, mo many of my exams come on a Monday morning. So my last minute revisions are on a Sunday. So how can I practice something called the Sabbath, sir? Yeah. Again, <clears throat> uh, 
I personally think that, uh, uh, you know, Sabbath was made for man. Man was not made for the Sabbath, which means that you can celebrate an alternative day for rest. Uh, like in the Middle East, the churches, Christians celebrate the church is on Friday. So Friday effectively becomes Sabbath. Um, and anyway, there are Christian denominations that uh, celebrate Sabbath on Saturdays. Um, and the Jews still celebrate Sabbath on Saturdays. Uh, I, I don't know whether it needs to be Sunday because Monday morning here would be a Sunday in the US. So it cannot be about a particular time. It can be, it needs to, it needs to be a rhythm. That means you have to have periods of rest and work, periods of rest and work. This is just my opinion. Others? Yeah. Um, Sam, you may want to say something more. Sir, about what? About sir? About. Uh, no, about about this uh, about Monday and Sunday. <laughs> no, no, sir. I think you have offered interesting insights including that it is Sunday is uh, Monday in the US and other things. <laughs> very, very interesting. I'm sure, sir. That is, uh, okay. Uh, but Sam, you know, I'm not a theologian. And no, you sir. are. So. <laughs> neither, neither am I, sir. I'm only an undergraduate uh, theology, sir. And undergraduates don't uh, call themselves theologians. Only the doctoral studies people call them. Oh, okay. I'm just... Uh, so I'm really nothing. <laughs> Okay, called, folks. Yeah, sorry. There's something called practical theologian, sir. So you are a great theologian in that sense. So, yeah, please. Ah, yes, I guess uh, when you are constantly thinking about right and wrong and about biblical principles, you do get some wisdom. Uh, there is a question. Yes. Somebody put to me. I yeah, know if you have finished your presentation, do yeah. you have a short time to share? Uh, how did you come to faith? Okay. Uh, if there is if there is no more things to ask from others. Okay. Okay. Are there something else that you want me to some any more questions? Others, I'll very briefly talk about how I came to know the Lord. Sir, this resting uh, or uh, you know, practicing the presence of God, uh, yeah. anyway, experiencing the presence of God, any other thing is by practice only it happens or instantaneously also will God uh, uh, give us? No, it happens by practice. It says in the scriptures, I forget the chapter and the verse, uh, <clears throat> just like... Uh, we know the voice of our wives or children, you know, because we have heard it so many times. Uh, similarly, we can sense God's presence once you, once you have practiced it often enough. It doesn't happen instantaneously. And I'll tell you the verse and the chapter a little later. Uh, but my, my sheep shall hear my voice. Eh? Yes, no, there is another. He says, uh, by discern because of the. Uh, it's about discernment because of practice. Okay. A mind that is. I can tell you that a little later, but uh, it. I'm, def I'm sure that it is not an instantaneous thing. It, you will not feel anything, but once you are practiced to it, you begin to feel the presence of God. It's happened to me a few times. It can happen 
when you practiced it long enough. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir, one, um, one of the practical situations, sir, yeah. is that uh, in our missions, yeah. including the large uh, teaching hospitals and uh, smaller missions, uh, there has, uh, uh, except in one or two places, there has been no concept of the Sabbath, sir. I think uh, uh, many of the doctors and the juniors and all, yes, uh, yes. even if they have a Sunday duty, yes. they do not have a day off, sir. So often it is a 14 days of continuous uh, uh, duties in many places. And uh, also in the <clears throat> big centers also it is uh, like that, so yeah. I wish, uh, uh, wish they also recognize and make some, of course it's not possible all the time, but it requires a sacrifice yeah. on the part of some people to enable that others can rest. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, I have found that uh, practically. So. Yes. Yes, I think uh, it is not a good thing, but I realize that uh, there are mission hospitals where there is only one doctor and that he may have no choice but to do that. But in such situations, I feel God gives grace because I was talking about sequential and synchronous rest, resting and working at the same time. So it's possible for God to give you grace so that you are able to do more of the work and rest at the same time, the synchronous variety. But if you have the choice, you should make sure that your staff get a day off. <clears throat> but if there is no other option, I guess, uh, and patients come and they, are ha they need an emergency, there's an emergency, then you may have no option, but then God can give you grace so that you can, uh, you can practice the more synchronous kind, kind of rest or take another day off or another half a day off uh, during the week when you have the time. So. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, I'll quickly uh, talk about my conversion. I come from a giant background uh, giants means people who don't hurt a fly, uh, who don't eat meat, of course, and also don't eat uh, root vegetables, you know, onions and garlic, because when you eat root vegetables, you destroy the whole plant. So that's why they don't eat uh, root vegetables. So uh, th that is giants, and they believe in karma, they don't believe in a creator God. They believe that each of us has the capacity to become gods <clears throat> by doing, uh, you know, good karma. Now, uh, I, we come from Porbandar in Gujarat and Mahatma Gandhi also comes from Porbandar. So, we used to take pride in the fact that he is from Porbandar. This is my grandfather and my father. And he, Mahatma Gandhi stayed in our house in Cochin. We had a small house opposite the town hall in Matancheri. Some of you who are from Kerala may know Matancheri. And there was, so we, we lived there. I mean, I never lived there. Neither did my father. Uh, my father may have been four or five years old. Uh, and so we, we boast about Gandhi and we bought all his books. And one of the things I read when I was young was the fact that Mahatma Gandhi said, when I read the Sermon on the Mount, it went straight to my heart. This is what Gandhi wrote. And he recommended that for everyone, including non-Christians. So, uh, I studied in Coimbatore and then 
I went to Loyola College in Chennai for pre-university. They used to have pre-university, uh, you know, you can do biology or mathematics. There were two main divisions. So I did the biology part in pre-university. And while I was studying there, I uh, was playing tennis badly. You know, I was never played tennis well, but there was a, a Catholic priest called Father Pinto. He also used to play tennis. And uh, he just became friends. And I told him once that, uh, what is the Sermon on the Mount? And then he sent a New Testament uh, with the, the pages marked, you know, Sermon on the Mount. And when I read it, I was uh, very deeply impacted. Uh, and then I began to attend Catholic Students Union meeting, CSU meetings. And they used to discuss lots of Christian things and they used to do a lot of uh, social action, you know, helping the poor and all that. And they used to do a lot of planning. So I used to attend those meetings and I so appreciate that very much. But the thought of becoming a Christian was not there at all. I had no intention at all of becoming a Christian. Neither did the father tell me to. Uh, but he recommended some good books to read, like uh, Imitation of Christ. I don't know if any of you have read that by Thomas Akempis and also C.S. Lewis. Uh, Catholics read C.S. Lewis, you know, and he had, uh, Mere Christianity was one I was asked to read. So I came into contact with C.S. Lewis quite early. <clears throat> and then uh, I forgot all about those things. I, after joining Velour, I was, uh, I completely forgot about Christian things. And then in the uh, sec, uh, in the first year clinical, I was uh, asked to attend some gospel meetings. Raju Abraham, my classmate, uh, he was a real pest. He used to drag me to these gospel meetings. And then one of the gospel meetings, they, there was a challenge saying, there is no use knowing about God. You have to know God. So that confused me a lot. What is knowing about God and knowing God? So I began to ask and then uh, I came to a position where I had to take a decision. And I became extremely depressed because I knew if I had to become a Christian, then it meant problems at home and it meant serving God and you know serving God can be so dull I thought I was in the Catholic Students Union you know and I used to see them going and helping the poor and all that and I didn't really have a stomach for that and I wanted to go to America and become a you know very wealthy doctor so this idea of becoming a Christian bothered me a great deal and I went into depression and then I went to see the psychiatrist here because I couldn't work. And so they gave me, in those days, they gave me MAO inhibitors. Any of you are psychiatrists will know that that is now not used at all, but it was used in those days. And I took it for several weeks. It didn't really help me a great deal, but I was again reading the Sermon on the Mount. And then it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. And that spoke to me. God said, all these other things that you want, uh, you want to go abroad and you want to make money and you want to make a name for yourself and all that, that you don't worry about. You seek the kingdom of God first. And other things you don't have to seek, it'll be added to you. It'll be given to you without your asking, whatever needs to be given. But for you, seek the kingdom of God first. And so that spoke to me and I took a decision. I was in room 414 on the, on the third floor of Men's Hostel when I took that decision, sometime in July. Uh, and then my depression disappeared slowly. And, you know, I began, I accepted the Lord. So that's how 
came to know the Lord. I had some tough time afterwards. I was sort of kidnapped by the giants in Coimbatore. They came in a van and then they knocked on the door in the middle of the night. They bundled me up and then the others emptied my room, put it on a truck and then drove me away uh, to a house in Coimbatore and locked me up. And there was a lot of uh, confusion for some time. Uh, it's all very far away now in my memory, but uh, I remember that in spite of all this, I was not very troubled because I knew God was with me. So about five or six weeks of this, uh, I endured. Fi finally, uh, we came to an agreement because my mother threatened them with police action. Uh, my mother was far more bolder than my father. My father would, wanted to give in to the giants, but my mother said, please don't interfere with my son. He wants to do good Why are you people unnecessarily bothering him. So they agreed to the terms that I set. I said, I will not become a Christian till I've studied Jainism and I will not go to church. So they allowed me to go back. So I did not go to church till I finished medicine. And after I finished internship, I studied Jainism for six months. Uh, actually, it was for one year, but the Jain Muni gave up after six months. He said, we know this incorrigible. He does not understand anything. And he left me alone. So then I left. So uh, that was end of chapter one. <laughs> and that's how I came to know the Lord. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank but you. I, I, I learned a lot about Jainism and I have been meaning to write an apology for Jains, a Christian apology. Um, you know, of late, Lots and lots of Jains have come to know the Lord. And there's a Jain Christian website. And uh, yeah, so I think it may be time now to do something with Jains. Okay, folks. Thank Any you. More comments? Otherwise, thank you, Santosh, and thank you, Sam, for this opportunity. And see you next week. Shall we close in prayer? Yes, certainly. Yes. Father in heaven, we thank you for the time which you gave us. Lord, as we come to the close of today's meeting, I pray that. Uh, the upcoming meetings also will be a blessing for us who uh, participate. And may your name be exalted in our midst. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, thank so, you, folks, and bye. Thank yeah, you. next week we come thank back uh, same time, four to six o'clock on seventh of November. Yeah. Yes, I I was told four o'clock, four to six. Yes. Yeah, four to six. Okay, bye Sam and bye Santosh and bye EMFI folks and all the others participants. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you so thank much, you. sir. It was, uh, it was uh, very nice. It was very informative as usual. Thank you, sir. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, bye. sir. Thank you bye. so much. Bye.